Now, neither I nor Desjardins Insurance had been retained to provide legal taxation or accounting advice. Hopefully none of you have been either. So play well in the sandbox with others is really what that's all about, okay? So what we're gonna do, as I said, is we're gonna take a look at the essential tips for beneficiary designations. These are things that, in my view, we all need to know, including the lawyers and accountants who advise our clients. And sadly, to my chagrin over mumble mumble number of years doing this kind of work, a huge and significant number of people don't know the basic rules, including a lot of lawyers and a lot of accountants. And we all are providing advice to our clients, and yet we may not know all of the rules. And then the focus very specifically on corporate owned insurance. And then finally, a summary to wrap it all up. And you know, the, real, the thing here is, there's increasing litigation involving beneficiary designations that have failed, sometimes spectacularly, and sometimes just miserably. But there is litigation in increasing amounts because clients are getting a lot savvier about things like who's entitled to the money, where is the money, how do we get a hold of the money, and there's been a lot of, there have been a number of court cases, um, particularly in the last three or four years, that have really have changed the way um, clients and their legal and tax advisors and their accounting advisors are approaching certain types of beneficiary designations. So I think it's really important to know your best practices, to know the technical rules enough to feel comfortable that if you are having a conversation with a fellow professional advisor that you feel comfortable saying, hey, but what about? Have you considered this issue? Because in the years that I've been doing this, almost 20%, one out of every five corporate-owned policy cases that I've looked at, has had a personal beneficiary designation, as an example. So a spouse or child of a shareholder, and in almost every case, there was never any discussion about some of the consequences of that kind of designation. So there were unplanned results that people weren't aware of. So it's understanding those kinds of things. And <clears throat> one of the starting points, we in Canada are blessed. We have two legal regimes that operate. We have the Civil Code of Quebec, and then we have the Common Law, which is in the other nine provinces and the three territories. Um, Quebec. The thing that we need to understand there is, yes, most of us are familiar, because we practice in Ontario. And those of you who are licensed in other common law provinces, you practice in those provinces as well. How many people here are licensed to practice in Quebec? If you look around the room, you will see that not a single hand went up. That is not an unusual response. But the reason you need to care about the civil code is this. Our clients move into and out of Quebec. They move their businesses into and out of Quebec. And so one of the things that happens is the civil code continues to apply to those policies, even though the client no longer, because it was issued in Quebec. So, you know, you can have the, this clash of titans almost between the civil code rules with respect to beneficiary designations and the common law rules with respect to beneficiary designations. And the unfortunate thing is they don't match. There are very significant differences. The other thing is we also have clients who've worked offshore, who've lived, you know, were born and raised or whatever, who've moved to Canada. One out of every five adult Canadians was born in another country. We are a country of immigrants. And what that means is we have clients who own policies that were issued outside of Canada. And you saw from Brian's presentation some of the issues that you may confront when, for example, you're dealing with the United States. 
but we also have clients who you know have moved around in the oil patch for example they've come from the united kingdom they've come from the european union they've come from all over the world and many of them come with policies that they already own and there may be some planning issues there as well so statutes you know the law you know, so the lawyer joke, the mandatory lawyer joke would be that, you know, if you're in Newfoundland and Labrador, note the pronunciation, you know, you'll hear with an extreme accent, you know, I want to introduce you to my liar. <laughs> that would be the lawyer. Yeah. Yeah, I said extreme accents. It's not always the case. So the statutes that you really need to have a grasp on for your practice the insurance legislation, it always helps to know your governing legislation a bit. Because you also, does everybody know that like the rules change for beneficiary designations um, for life insurance and living benefits in Ontario in 2016? You all knew that, right? Sure you did. Okay. <laughs> That's another fun topic. Scared the living bejesus out of a bunch of lawyers and accountants on that one. It was fun. So uh, creditor protection provisions, both under the insurance legislation and the Federal Bankruptcy and Insolvency Act. Provincial rules on intestacy. If your client dies without a will, as roughly between 55 and 60% of adult Canadians do not have wills and they do not have powers of attorney. Congratulations, you've chosen to allow your home province to determine who inherits what and how. Good job. And that, you know, $5,000 or $2,000 or $3,000 that it costs to have wills and POAs or trusts done, it's really worth it when you look at some of the litigation that comes up because people have died without a will. And your provincial statutes for non-insurance designations. So in Ontario, that's the Succession Law Reform Act. And that applies to those beneficiary designations that you would make for, no, your clients would make for non-insurance RSPs, RIFs, tax-free savings accounts. So you need to know two different sets of rules. Then, depending on your practice, you may want to know about the trustee investment rules because if you're dealing with a trust that perhaps owns life insurance or if you're doing investments and you're dealing with a trust, you want to understand the rules that govern what you might be able to invest in on behalf of your clients. You want to understand the power of attorney legislation, both for uh, personal care, but primarily for property management. And if it, does anybody here have clients who are from British Columbia, who live in BC? Does anybody practice in BC? British Columbia's legislation actually allows beneficiary designations by an attorney for property for both non-insurance products and for insurance products. They changed their legislation a number of years ago. So when we always knee-jerk say you can't do that, you have to say except in BC. So if your clients are in BC or from BC, that may be another issue. Financial management, personal care, end of life, made, medical assistance in dying, a solution made in Canada. Um, the names of the documents, what we call these documents, a will is a will, right? But powers of attorney have different names across Canada. So you may end up hearing different terminology. And then corporate and partnership government laws, if, governance laws, if you're dealing with business owners, then you need to have some understanding of the laws that apply to how they run, set up and run their businesses. Now, so now down to the, the boring stuff, which I personally find very, very exciting because I have a lot of fun with it. So how do you make a beneficiary designation? And you start with saying very carefully, okay? And then you follow it up by saying, it has to be in writing. To date in Canada, a videotaped or recorded audio recording of a beneficiary designation, they are not allowed. Saskatchewan, you will know, has upheld beneficiary designations for insurance products made by way of email. Hmm, interesting. So there's the, the first place that your client will make a beneficiary designation is on the insurance application. And the application, of course, if the policy is issued, becomes part of the contract. 
So that's where, when you talk about on the policy or in the contract, that's where that one comes from. Then what we have is the policy change forms. Every life co that you deal with has different forms. There is no consistency between how they set up their forms, and we'll circle back to that one. So beneficiary change on using the company forms. Another place, Brian's talked about it. Beneficiary designations can be done in a will. And any standalone document. So that would be kind of where Saskatchewan sort of slid that email thing in by saying it was kind of like sort of maybe almost but not quite a standalone document. But it could be a completely separate one. It could be a letter that's signed and dated in your client's handwriting ideally. So then, some of the key rules. The most recent designation governs. So where we get into trouble with this one is when we do beneficiary designations in a will. The will itself is in force from the moment it is signed. But it's not like that you know, your heirs, your beneficiaries of your estate can come and take away your stuff while you're alive. Because all of the other terms and provisions in the will don't come into force until what happens? You've died. However, beneficiary designations in a will, whether for insurance products or non-insurance products, are in force from the moment they are signed. Not it comes into force when the client dies, but rather no, the designation is in force the moment your client signs a will. So if your client signs a will on April Fool's Day with a beneficiary designation for a million dollar life insurance policy, that, becomes, that supersedes, it revokes and replaces the beneficiary designation that was on the application when they'd originally applied for their insurance. Now if they sign a beneficiary designation form that says, as per my will, dated April Fool's Day 2019, now you're into an area where there, might, there can be litigation. Because technically, when they signed that designation, they revoked the previous designation. When they signed the, comp the change form from their insurance company, technically, they revoked the designation that was in the will. And now you're referring to something that's called a legal nullity. And we'll come back to that one. So in writing, most recent designation governs. It revokes and replaces the old designation, any previous revocable designation. The other important thing is that an existing beneficiary designation, for example, in a will, does not apply to life insurance products, to insurance products that were acquired after the date of the will. So, if your client signed a will on April Fool's Day of 2019, and then bought a new life insurance policy that was issued, that's gonna be issued, say, June 1st of 2019, the beneficiary designation in the April Fool's Day will does not apply to that new policy. And that's another area where there are some gaps. There's some weird Saskatchewan. Saskatchewan does some really weird stuff. There's a couple of kind of weird cases out of Saskatchewan, but Ontario hasn't followed them. <laughs> so bottom line, when your client does that, where they've got an existing designation for existing insurance and they acquire a new policy, you don't want, they can't go without a designation. They need a designation for that new insurance. Um, and again, so beneficiary designation, again, in a will or a standalone document, only apply to the stuff that's in force the date that designation is signed. Same logic. And you can make a beneficiary designation for your group insurance. And one of the 2016 changes that's huge, that can potentially affect sales of insurance in the family market. 
Remember the old, you know, the old rule was, well, if, you know, if your client changes, you know, their, their company changes their group insurance carrier, you know, the designation is gone, it's revoked, you can't carry it forward. Now you can. If the two life codes agree, the designation, say it's a Canada Life group plan and it's replaced with a Desjardins plan, because we are a large group insurance company, um, what would happen is if those two companies agree, the designation from the old group plan can be carried over, ported over to the new plan. So again, something to be aware of. Beneficiary designation, the classes, the kinds of beneficiary designations you can make. And do you note those two little words right up there at the top that say outside Quebec? There's a reason for that. Because the Quebec rules are really radically different. Okay? So the preferred class, and this is, a, this is a wording and terminology thing that kind of we get stuck with. The preferred class of beneficiary designations in the common law provinces actually refers to policies that were issued on or before July 1st of 1962. Now there aren't a lot of those policies still out there, but they do still exist. And when you're doing like this global beneficiary designation, lawyers love to do it. You know, all insurance on my life captures this London life, old, you know, Jubilee whole life, that $2,500 policy that parents bought somebody or whatever it is. Yeah, it captures those things. But here's the thing. Note the wording. Husband or wife, so legally married, opposite sex couples only, Biological children, legally adopted children, grandchildren, children of adopted children, meaning grandchildren from a child who's been adopted, the father or mother, again, opposite sex couples only, and adoptive parents, meaning father and mother, of the person whose life is insured, not the policy owner, not the policy owner. So when we talk about the insured, one of the challenges is the Insurance Act uses insured, the insured, to refer to the policy owner, not the person whose life is insured. And that's one of the areas where it can be problematic. And in Quebec, the beneficiary designation rules spring out of the relationship of the beneficiary to the person whose life not the person whose life is insured, but the policy owner. So you can, sometimes depending on who owns the policy and everything, you'll get exactly the same results when you're looking at a policy issued in Quebec and one issued in Ontario. And other times you'll get something radically different. And that's one of the big areas where we get into trouble. The family class is the one that most of us in our practice years are familiar with. This is for all the policies issued after July 1st of 1962. And because of changes in the insurance legislation when Canada enacted same-sex marriage, and we also recognized uh, common law spouses, it's the spouse legally married or common law, opposite sex or same sex, children, but not foster children, stepchildren, not yet. That's a tax issue. That's not an insurance issue, so you need to be careful there as well grandchildren and parents, male or female, we don't care. And because under the All Families Are Equal Act, which is in force in Ontario, a child potentially can have up to four people listed as parent on their birth certificate now. Yeah, yeah. So, parents of the person whose life is insured. Irrevocable or irrevocable, because it is English and we do that. We have certain words that we like to pronounce two different ways depending on where you know you learn to speak English. So irrevocable, irrevocable. This is the one where you cannot change the designation without the written consent of the irrevocable beneficiary. Now think about that one. If your irrevocable beneficiary is either a minor who cannot consent to a change or is a person who is mentally incapable and cannot consent to a change. 
So one little tip there would be, under no circumstances, please do not designate minors as irrevocable beneficiaries of insurance products. The Office of the Children's Lawyer will have a lot of fun things to say with you, and it will not end well. Okay? It will not end well if you want to make a change. Same thing if someone is mentally incapable of managing their finances, please, again, do not designate them as an irrevocable beneficiary. And then the ordinary class is anything that doesn't fall into one of the preceding three groups. So the question was, your client wants the life insurance proceeds to go to a specific individual. We'll call them individual number one. And they've done a beneficiary designation using the company form or on the application designating individual one as the beneficiary. Subsequently, the client signs a will that says all of my life insurance divided, say, between individual one and individual two in equal shares. The will, because it's dated after the other beneficiary designation, technically, yes, it supersedes the designation of individual one as the sole beneficiary. So what if the client then signs a new beneficiary change form? So again, think policies issued on January 2nd of 2019, individual one is the designated beneficiary. Client signs a will on April 1st, 2019, designating you know, all insurance on my life equally between individual one and individual two. That supersedes the beneficiary designation of January 2nd. The client comes into the office and says, hey, I've changed my mind, and they do a new beneficiary change form that designates individual one again. That designation on June 1st is now the governing designation. So when you have clients who like to change, do beneficiary designation changes, you know, serial beneficiary designation changers, it can be difficult to track which rules apply. If you do a will entirely in your own handwriting, signed and no witnesses, that is a holograph will. As soon as you add one witness, whether it's handwritten or typed or whatever, that's you need in Ontario, you need two witnesses for a valid traditional or formal will. If your beloved spouse who has wonderful handwriting writes everything out and you sign it, that is not a valid will because it was not your handwriting, it was your beloved spouse's handwriting, which again could be problematic. A beneficiary designation to a specific individual, group of individuals, to an organization like a charity, to a corporation, etc., when it's included in a will, the proceeds are not subject to probate. However, if the designation, if all the designated beneficiaries have died, or no longer exist in the case, say, of a corporation that's been wound up, the default designation is always the estate, at which point, yes, the proceeds would be into the estate and subject to probate and creditors. The onus is on the client when they do a beneficiary designation on anything except the application or contract or a beneficiary change form to notify the Life Co. If the Life Co. receives that notification, then that they update their records and that becomes the beneficiary designation on the insurance company's records. If you fail to notify the Life Co., and for example, going back to the individual one, individual two scenario, individual one, you know, the insured person dies, individual one gets in there, signs the you know, claim form, gets the money, runs away to a country where there is no extradition, individual two is um, out of luck because the Life Co. will have distributed the proceeds to the last known beneficiary of whom they had a record. And the Life Co. gets to walk away in that scenario, and the onus then falls on the battling beneficiaries to slug it out. And if they liked each other before they started to slug it out, they probably won't by the time they're done. Okay, now, what about a class beneficiary as a designation as opposed to Class C, okay, or Class Sick? So class is when you say, all of my children in equal shares. My issue, which hopefully you will follow with in equal shares per stirpes as opposed to equal shares per capital because they do two different things. Okay, so heirs, next of kin, personal representative under insurance legislation in the common law provinces equals the estate. My children or my issue is generally valid because 
it's clearer than saying heirs, because heirs could include your parents. Your, you know, if you die without a will, it might include your parents, it might include your aunts or uncles, it might include nieces or nephews. It all depends on who, how fruitful your family was in terms of multiplying, and who's still alive. I dealt with an estate once where it went on an intestacy to 193 individuals in 47 countries. It took five years to sort that one out. And they all got about 12 cents. <laughs> okay, so um, Canadian law no longer distinguishes as of about 1978 in all provinces, including Quebec, between children born inside of legal marriage and children born outside of legal marriage. Those would be formerly the children known as bastards. So now what you get is no longer bastards by birth, merely bastards by choice. And we all probably know a few of those. So, warning. Warning, warning, warning. The Wills, Estates, and Succession Act in BC and the All Families Are Equal Act in Ontario have some very significant changes to some of the definitions for insurance purposes of class like children and issue. Remember I said that a child could have up to four parents under the All Families Are Equal Act? Well, now what you also have is that if you store genetic material and then you kick the bucket, and you and the person with whom you'd had a partnership, relationship, legal marriage, common law, or otherwise, um, had signed an agreement before you died that you were going to try and have a child together and use this genetic material, they have up to 36 months from the date of death to have that child. And that child will be an heir for all purposes, including dependence relief. Now, can you imagine what that does to insurance stuff? So try to discourage your clients from using class designations like all my children. It is better to name them. Erica Kane would be one of the people from all my children, for those of you who used to watch it. Um, but what you need to be careful of is if they have another child, you know, the heir and the spare, and they have only named the heir, but not the spare, the heir gets everything. That's how the cookie crumbles. So when your clients start to name beneficiaries specifically, you need to remind them if you choose to adopt or, you know, you have stepchildren you want to receive insurance, you know, you have to give me their names and update us. Designating two or more. Now, this is not no on the arc where it's only two, only two, okay? You could potentially designate five different beneficiaries. You could say they all get it in equal shares, which, by the way, if you don't say anything, they automatically get it in equal shares. But you could get a little bit fancy, hiring a lawyer, hopefully, or you could do it yourself. Do you remember the slide of Brian's where he said, you know, the distribution was 25%, one third, 50, all? That's the kind of math. If you cannot count more than one, two, three, four, many, you probably need assistance in calculating how the designation will be work out, particularly if it's not readily divisible by an even number. Because the last time I checked, 13, 13 cents, which you can get sometimes on like UL policies and stuff like that, is not readily divisible by anything that resembles anything for easy arithmetic. So if your beneficiary dies or ceases to exist in the case of a corporation or a registered charity, for example, before the person whose life is insured, their right to receive the, pro the share of the proceeds dies as well. And again, please always make sure, oh, by the way, Charities Directorate, the most cool place to go on the entire CRA website. Why? Because you can search the name of charities. It will give you the correct legal name and whether it in fact exists. So that your client will not do a beneficiary designation in favor of the Heart, Stroke, and Kidney Foundation of Ontario. It's happened. And you know what? The charities slug it out in court over who gets the money. Contingent beneficiaries only become entitled to a share of the insurance proceeds when either all of the primary beneficiaries have died or no longer exist, or if a contingent beneficiary is named for each primary beneficiary. I designate individual one, and if individual one has died, individuals one's children A and B. A and B are the contingent beneficiaries for individual one. 
In the case of individual two, you might say I designate individual two, but there's no contingent beneficiary. So if individual two dies, individual A gets the whole enchilada. And make sure that the shares always add up to 100% of the proceeds when you divvy this stuff up. Appointing a trustee for a beneficiary, this is the only part where I'm gonna kind of cross over with what Brian had said. You can appoint a trustee to receive insurance proceeds on behalf of any beneficiary. It can be on company form, in a separate document, in a will. Most life co forms are drafted so that they, they look at, if you're gonna appoint a trustee for a beneficiary, they're typically thinking it's minors. But you might wanna designate a trustee, have proceeds go into trust for a parent who has dementia. In which case, you're probably not gonna be able to use those life co forms, and you're going to need to consult with a qualified legal practitioner. You're not gonna see it in a corporate scenario, it's gonna be personally owned typically. Now one of the things there is how that designation is structured. Now please note, the rules for Quebec are radically different because uh, they, don't, they imported trusts in 1992 into the civil code when they amended it. They create what's called a patrimony. And that's as far as we're going with how the civil code deals with getting money into and out of trusts and everything. It's brutally complicated and very different than here. So, um, setting up, running, and winding up an insurance trust takes both time and money. You heard Brian talk about it. It's not for the timid or the cheap, okay? But there are a lot of scenarios where a trust to receive insurance proceeds or to own a policy can be a very, very um, powerful planning tool that I don't think enough attention gets paid to that tool um, when it is, the focus is primarily on corporate planning, but there are also a lot of opportunities with personal planning, and Brian touched on many of those as well. Um, actually, I'm just gonna go here real quick. Um, when I say insurance proceeds are modest, every time, if you've got income, once those proceeds are invested, you will have income that may trigger a tax return. The tax return has to be reported filed, you're gonna have dealing with you know, the trustees when they have to deal with the money and passing the accounts and stuff. If it's less than about a quarter of a million dollars, it's probably too little money. For clients who are relying on their group insurance, you know, one-time salary for their kids, for the love of all that is holy, please don't do contingent beneficiary designations with appointing a trustee for the minor kids. Put it into the will, the estate, by way of a good beneficiary, a will, that has a trust for the kids. That is so much better for those clients. Okay, individual owners and lack of capacity. Attorneys for property typically, they don't have statutory authority to make beneficiary designations because they are akin to or similar to a will. And again, the exception. The Powers of Attorney Act in British Columbia for insurance products allows it under three very specific and limited circumstances. The WESA for non-insurance products allows it again in certain limited circumstances. A lot of life codes, a lot of financial institutions, banks, etc., are allowing beneficiary designations under, again, they have a protocol that sidesteps the official app stuff, but it usually involves people signing like warranties, you know, personal liability and stuff like that, providing copies of wills and a whole bunch of other things that, oh, wait, the 60% of clients who don't have wills, it doesn't work. So it becomes very complex. Um, change of ownership. If the grantor of a power of attorney for property is incapable, you have switched from being during lifetime while you are capable, they are your agent. They act on your instructions. When they become incapable, their role flips to being a fiduciary. And if you transfer assets into your own name as an attorney for property, you'll be pleased to know that there are sections, there's a section in the criminal code because that's considered financial abuse of an elder and theft. That is a word that we usually don't want to have apply, but people do this all the time. They transfer investment accounts into joint ownership, the attorney for property and things like that, and they don't even talk about the tax consequences or the creditor protection issues and a whole bunch of other things. But just start with the T word, theft. That usually 
gets their attention. So transferring ownership of a personally owned life insurance or living benefits policy when the person who owns it is incapable is not going to happen, okay? Or should not happen. Company forms, yeah, okay. So the one on the, desig on the, form the application governs once the policy is settled. That's the one on or in the policy. You can, again, change it in three ways. You can sign the company change forms. You can do it in your will. You can do it in a standalone document. Um, if you have an irrevocable designation or you have collaterally assigned it for borrowings, you will probably need the written consent of that beneficiary. Industry practice is not uniform regarding your revocation wording. So how do you revoke it? So some companies, it says specifically on the change form that it revokes all previous designations. That's for those of us who are paying attention to read the fine print, okay? Others, it's silent, and it is expected that you and your clients will understand the insurance rules that say when you sign a new designation, it revokes the old one. So, Please, I know advisors hate to read company minutia. The administrivia of being an advisor. When your life co, everyone that you have a license with, sends out new forms, please read them. And then read them a second time. And then read them a third time. Just to make sure that you got it right, okay? Primary and contingent designations, we are even further into the weeds, my friends. Because, again, the industry is not consistent. Some life codes on their change form or even their application will allow you, specifically it splits the designation. It says primary beneficiary you know, and contingent beneficiary. And they will allow you and your client to amend either one of those things without changing the other. Other life codes, a little more traditional, a little more neurotically conservative, not that I'm expressing an opinion there, um, will insist that if you want to make a change to the contingent beneficiary, that you're going to have to update the entire designation, the primary plus the contingent. No consistency, none. Good luck. Read the forms, okay? Read the forms. Other areas for caution. Okay, so now we know the general rule. You sign a new designation, it revokes all previous ones. What the Insurance Act does not provide for, a partial revocation. That's the one where the life code does this split between primary and contingent, and you do one part but not the other. That would be a partial revocation. It doesn't apply to incorporation by reference, which is a techno weenie term used by lawyers where what they do is they import one document into another. So think of that as they sign the beneficiary change form saying, as per, my, as per the beneficiary designation in paragraph two of my will dated April Fool's Day of 2019. It is not, no legislation clearly says, if you do that, we will import the April Fool's Day designation, meaning it survives. Then there's three R words, republication, revival, and resurrection because it's like Lent, okay? So we have to have resurrection in there. So here's the thing. There's no mechanism to restore, revive, republish, resurrect a designation that has been revoked. You have to make a new designation. But there's a little bit of case law and most of it is determined by, has been determined, I think, by judges who don't actually understand insurance. And in a lot of cases, the, case, the, the, the facts were argued by lawyers who don't understand insurance either. So that's kind of scary. But bottom line on it is, last date of designation governs. They have to be in writing. Don't screw it up. So corporate-owned policies at the time of application, the issues and the best practices. So here we go. You name a whole co or family member as a beneficiary, and the opco owns it. 
It creates a shareholder benefit, a taxable shareholder benefit. Now, you may, for non-tax purposes, want the insurance to go there, but at least have the conversation. So typically, best practices would be the corporation that owns it would be the beneficiary. As I said, there may be some limited exceptions. I dealt with one file once where the death benefit was a million dollars. It was corporate owned. The grieving widow had been designated as the beneficiary, and she continued to grieve for three years because CRA had done an audit, and they figured out, oh my gosh, there's this million dollars. She got it personally. And their opening salvo when the discussions was, well, we think the entire million dollars is a taxable benefit. They negotiated their way down to the value of the premiums for every year that the designation was in place, plus penalties and interest, which reopened the tax returns of the deceased shareholder and the corporation for several years. It was unfortunate and it was also unplanned so review your files and update the designations where um, necessary corporate agreements so you've got a documentation structure in place and you know have you ever noticed that a lot of clients think they know their corporate structure but don't really now you saw a couple of Brian's pictures okay some a lot of corporate structures are complicated some are really simple and what scares me is a lot of times the clients still don't get the simple stuff right either. Okay? So the designation doesn't match the documentation or the structure. So are there other shareholders? Get copies of signed shareholder agreements or buy-sell agreements, particularly if the purpose of the life insurance is to fund a buy-sell agreement. Uh, does the agreement deal with the insurance proceeds? Because a lot of buy-sell agreements that are supposed to be insurance funded don't actually agree, don't deal with the insurance proceeds. And verify that the policy was signed by the correct authorized signatories. Now a lot of your clients may be sole shareholders, sole directors of their corporation, and the sole signing officer. If they die, who signs the death claim? Oh, that would be the directors. They appoint a new signing officer. But the only director is dead. Who appoints a director? The shareholder. The shareholder is dead. Who now owns the shares? The estate. If that is like 60% of our clients, guess what they don't have? They don't have a will. And that can become difficult and take a very long time to get those kinds of things sorted out. So another one is, you know, they get the name of their own company wrong. <laughs> Swear to God, I've seen that so many times. They get the name of their own company wrong. They do, right? That's why seeing, actually seeing the Articles of Incorporation is a really good idea. Um, shared ownership. Now, note... Do you see the words split dollar up there? No. That's because split dollar, when talking about insurance, is like waving a red flag in front of the CRA bull. So call it what it really is, which is shared ownership. Okay. So ownership of each element of policy, you need to define it. It needs to be clearly defined in terms of who owns what. Who has a right to make or change beneficiary designations? So the best practice is really, from your perspective, protecting you. When your client does a shared ownership structure, written, and you know about it when they're doing it, some written advice that says, hey, you should be talking to lawyers and accountants, tax and legal people, to make sure that this documentation is done correctly. Because, and there's just a little bit of a list of some of the things that you may need to cover or their legal and tax and accounting advisors should be addressing. Not your job to fix it, but it's definitely, that can be a problem. Oh, and yeah, you know, a signed shared ownership agreement is just like a signed buy-sell agreement. Way better than none at all, or one that's been drafted and never signed. So now, the policy's been issued, it's in force. Let's take a quick look. I would say in one out of three cases that I've worked on where there's been a corporate restructuring, 
Everybody has completely forgotten about the existence of the life insurance. $400,000 cash value life policy and the physician went offshore and allowed his corporation's registration to lapse. He returned to Canada six months before it would have us cheated to the crown. Another client who changed her medical professional corporation, opened up a new one, changed, you know, the existing medical professional corporation to a numbered company, gave the same name to her new medical professional corporation and completely forgot to tell her investment and insurance advisors until two years after the fact. There was a corporate owned investment account and a corporate owned life insurance policy. It took a year and a half to straighten that one out. When you're talking with your clients, ideally annually, are you planning any changes to your existing structure as a reorganization, maybe a sale of the shares, a wind up? If so, let me know so that you can remind them about the policy. Now, if they change the name of their corporation, you probably, for simplicity, they would want to change the beneficiary designation to the new corporate name. Their change of corporate structure may trigger a need to change the ownership or the beneficiary designation. And if they change jurisdictions, particularly if they go offshore outside of Canada, again, there may be some issues there. So legal and tax advice before they implement the changes, because fixing things after they've done the changes is much harder than getting the advice before. And uh, so, sale of the corporation, you sell your shares. And there's corporate owned life insurance, corporate owned living benefits insurance. Do you want the new owner to own the insurance on your life? But that happens a lot because everybody forgets that it exists. You wind it up. Same thing can happen with a trust. I've seen that one happen. Four years after the trust was wound up, that wound up, they realized that there were three life insurance policies still owned by the trust that had not been transferred out. It was a little interesting. So ideally, really, that policy is going to be transferred out before the sale or the wind up. There may be limited exceptions. And ownership, transfer of ownership usually triggers a disposition and potential taxable benefits. So again, legal taxation and accounting advice is required. Corporations and split beneficiaries. This is a fun one because the tax rules changed in 2016. So under the old CDA rules, one corporation would get 50% of a million dollar death benefit and 50% of the adjusted cost basis, meaning $100,000. The other corporation gets the same 50%. The CDA credit is 400. So the combined capital dividend that goes out tax-free would have been $800,000. CRA, being rather brighter than hamsters, figured out that this was maybe an unforeseen and needlessly favorable outcome. And so post-2016, 100% of the ACB is applied against both beneficiaries. So instead of a capital dividend of 800,000 between the two companies, it's only 600,000. You want to have non-tax reasons to do that kind of a split now. It's not saying you can't or you shouldn't, but you want to have good non-tax reasons for doing it. Key documentation for corporate clients. <coughs> corporate owned life insurance, corporate owned living benefits insurance on the shareholders. I always like files where there is, there is life insurance better than ones where there isn't because I think it does facilitate. Um, being familiar with the articles of incorporation, any amendments, an outline of the corporate structure, updated as required. Um, don't rely on your client, in fact, conveying accurate information. Uh, business needs analysis form. Any company that you're dealing with, any of the life codes, any of the brokerage, you know, MGAs, should have some kind of a business needs analysis form that will help you quantify, identify, validate the insurance need while also collecting information about the business. Update it. It becomes part of your record. An executed by sell agreement or a shared ownership agreement. Again, now, these are not do-it-yourself documents, okay? That's kind of like a do-it-yourself appendectomy. Not something that should be undertaken by average people. <clears throat> These are documents that should be drafted by legal professionals who are familiar with corporate law, tax law, and dealing with insurance. 
an executed shareholder agreement if you've got two or more shareholders. Wills and POAs for every shareholder. And if they have a spouse, whether legally married or common law, their spouse. Detailed planning memo. You know that complex structure, a couple of those that Brian showed you? Do they come with like a planning memo or something that outlines what they want to have happen? Yeah. Yeah, I know. See, you're saying yeah, but a lot of people don't have one. <laughs> again, a detailed memorandum that, again, the legal and tax advisors who are doing the complex planning ideally prepare one so that the family members will know what the heck is supposed to happen or the executors. And, you know, frankly, corporate owned insurance is a wonderful thing. But there can be estate planning reasons to have personally owned coverage, including it can take months or years in the case of litigation to get the proceeds out of a corporation. And what does the family live on? Now, you know, my cat was the Prince of Darkness. That was indeed his nickname. Um, and, you know, he was large economy model, 15 pound cat. Uh, long hair, so he wasn't actually as big as you thought he was. Um, but, you know, like fluffy cat slippers and, and dinner is not exactly anything that anybody should have to do. But personally owned insurance, there is an opportunity, in my view, to have that conversation instead of always going to the corporate owned. Corporate owned is wonderful, but don't overlook the opportunity for some personal coverage. Best practices for using company forms. Read the application and the policy or beneficiary change forms for every company you're licensed with. Review the forms whenever they announce changes. Assess your risk tolerance and decide how, comf how conservatively or aggressively you're going to do beneficiary planning strategies. I'm on the really conservative side when it comes to doing insurance trust designations, just because I never really wanted my clients to end up in, um, in front of a judge who didn't know anything about insurance. So there are a number of different approaches to some of these things. So you need to assess your risk tolerance. As you're talking with clients about their risk tolerance, what's your risk tolerance? Because there's no one true way to do this. You just need to be diligent. Have a consistent practice that you use with every single case. Because if you are sued, having that consistent practice is going to be a lifesaver, especially if you document it. It's part of the KYC. You need to know your clients. It's part of your sales process. Your regulators require it. You need to know. You've got to ask the questions about the directors, the shareholders, the trustees, the beneficiaries, all of those kinds of things. You need to ask those questions and keep them in your file. Do's and don'ts, because you know we can't have one without the other, right? So proactive KYC, get a current copy of the corporate structure if you can. Talk about changes of the, in those structure with your client and remind the clients always if they have corporate owned life insurance, you know, there's nothing wrong with putting it in your reporting letter to say, you know, if you're contemplating any changes to your corporate structure, always remember to tell your legal taxation and accounting advisors that these policies exist. Don't rely on the company client's explanation. Generally speaking, rule of thumb, avoid personal beneficiaries for corporate owned policies. And, you know, split corporate beneficiaries. You saw that example, the change in the capital dividend account. Unless there are really good non-tax reasons, you probably don't want your clients to do that anymore. It used to be a really great planning strategy that got slain by the dragons of finance. So, practice management. Um, you know, quantify the need. That's what those business needs analysis forms are for. Identifying who should be the owner, because the money should go where the money needs to be. That applies to personal ownership insurance, and it applies to corporate, and it applies to trust-owned in insurance. The money should go where the money needs to be. And get that legal advice. Have your clients get that legal and tax advice. Does anybody here gamble? Because here's the thing, when you leave this industry, when you finally retire, the reality is the longer you are in practice, the more lives you will have touched. The more lives you have touched, you know what? It's a question of if, not a question of when. You leave this industry, you buy the best runoff E&O insurance that you possibly can. 
And planning is not a one and done. There are six elements, there are eight things on that wheel instead of the traditional four that you might, six that you might see from financial planning. That's because at Desjardins, down when we're talking about business owners, we add business succession and business continuation planning. You can step onto and off of that planning wheel anywhere and, you know, take your clients to the discussion that it needs to be. And by the way, if they run screaming in the opposite direction when you say insurance, Talk about risk management, because that's all insurance is, is it's transferring risk to the insurance company. 